April the 27th. This day, I shot a condor. It measured from tip to tip of the wings eight and a half feet, and from beak to tail, four feet. This bird is known to have a wide geographical range, being found on the west coast of South America from the Strait of Magellan, along the Cordillera, as far as eight degrees north of the equator. The steep cliff near the mouth of the Rio Negro is its northern limit on the Patagonian coast and they have there wandered about 400 miles from the great central line of their habitations in the Andes. It seems that the condors require perpendicular cliffs. In Chile they haunt, during the greater part of the year, the lower country near the shores of the Pacific, and at night several roost together in one tree. But in the early part of summer they retire to the most inaccessible parts of the inner cordillera, there to breed in peace. With respect to their propagation, I was told by the country people in Chile that the condor makes no sort of nest, but in the months of November and December lays two large white eggs on a shelf of bare rock. It is said that the young condors cannot fly for an entire year, and long after they are able, they continue to roost by night and hunt by day with their parents. The old birds generally live in pairs, but among the inland basaltic cliffs of the Santa Cruz I found a spot where scores must usually haunt. On coming suddenly to the brow of the precipice, it was a grand spectacle to see between twenty and thirty of these great birds start heavily from their resting place and wheel away in majestic circles. They may oftentimes be seen at a great height, soaring over a certain spot. On some occasions I am sure that they do this only for pleasure, but on others the Chilono countryman tells you that they are watching a dying animal, or the puma devouring its prey. If the condors glide down and then suddenly all rise together, the Chileno knows that it is the puma which, watching the carcass, has sprung out to drive away the robbers. When the condors are wheeling in a flock round and round any spot, their flight is beautiful. Except when rising from the ground, I do not recollect ever having seen one of these birds flap its wings. I watched several for nearly half an hour, without once taking off my eyes. They moved in large curves, sweeping in circles, descending and ascending, without giving a single flap. As they glided close over my head, I intently watched from an oblique position the outlines of the separate and great terminal feathers of each wing. And these separate feathers, if there had been the least vibratory movement, would have appeared as if blended together, but they were seen distinct against the blue sky. The head and neck were moved frequently, and apparently with force, and the extended wings seemed to form the fulcrum on which the movements of the neck, body and tail acted. If the bird wished to descend, the wings were for a moment collapsed, and when again expanded with an altered inclination, the momentum gained by the rapid descent seemed to urge the bird upwards with the even and steady movement of a paper kite. In the case of any bird soaring, its motion must be sufficiently rapid so that the action of the inclined surface of its body on the atmosphere may counterbalance its gravity. The force to keep up the momentum of a body moving in a horizontal plane in the air, in which there is so little friction, cannot be great, and this force is all that is wanted. The movements of the neck and body of the condor, we must suppose, is sufficient for this. However this may be, it is truly wonderful and beautiful to see so great a bird hour after hour, without any apparent exertion, wheeling and gliding over mountain and river. April the 29th From some high land we hailed with joy the white summits of the Cordillera, as they were seen occasionally peeping through their dusky envelope of clouds. During the few succeeding days we continued to get on slowly, for we found the river course very tortuous, and strewed with immense fragments of various ancient slate rocks and of granite. It is, I believe, quite impossible to explain the transportal of these gigantic masses of rock so many miles from their parent source on any theory except by that of floating icebergs. During the last two days we met with signs of horses and with several small articles which had belonged to the Indians, such as parts of a mantle and a bunch of ostrich feathers, but they appeared to have been lying long on the ground. The country seems to be quite unfrequented. Nevertheless, in two places in this very central region, I found small heaps of stones, which
which I do not think could have been accidentally thrown together, placed on points projecting over the edge of the highest lava cliff.